Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Self-Adjoint and Normal Operators. In this video, we will be focusing on adjoints. Let's quickly go over what will be our standard notation until further notice. F denotes either the scalar field of real numbers R or the scalar field of complex numbers C. Also, we will let V and W both denote finite dimensional inner product spaces over F. Notice the new assumption that V and W are finite dimensional. That will be required for our next set of results, and it's easier just to make that a standing assumption than to repeat that hypothesis in each result. Suppose T is a linear map from V to W. The adjoint of T will be a function denoted T star going in the other direction from W to V. Here's how we define T star. Fix a vector W in our vector space W. Look at the linear map on V that sends a vector V to T of V inner product W. In other words, W is fixed, and we're looking at the linear functional that sends V to the left side of the equation that you can see here. We have a theorem that we discussed in a previous video, that every linear functional on V is of the form V inner product something. Thus, the left-hand side, which is T of V inner product W, must equal V inner product something for every vector in V. We call that something T star of W. In other words, T star of W is the unique vector in V that makes the displayed equation true for every vector V in V. Let's look at an example, which should help clarify what's going on. Let T be the linear map from R3 to R2, defined as you can see on the screen now. Thus, T star will go in the other direction from R2 to R3. To compute T star, we fix a point Y1, Y2 in R2. Now, for every X1, X2 in R3, we have x1, x2, x3, in a product with t star y1, y2, is equal to, and the t flips over to the other side, as you can see on the right-hand side of the equation. That's the definition of adjoint. Now we just replace t with its definition, and you can see that we've done that. What we have here is the inner product of two vectors in R2, and we just compute that inner product. Of course, we are using here the standard inner product on R2 and on R3. Now we rewrite that inner product as x1, x2, x3 with something, and just looking at it, we can see what the something is. Just look carefully, you'll see this last equation is correct. Now I've just highlighted the things in the first equation and the last equation that x1, x2, x3 is being inner product with. This equation is true for all x1, x2, x3 in R3, and thus the two objects in red must be equal. In other words, we must have t star of y1, y2 is equal to 2y2, comma, y1, comma, 3y1. Thus, in this case, we have computed t star successfully. Now we want to display some properties of the adjoint. The definition of the adjoint is displayed from the previous slide. The first property is the adjoint is a linear map. In other words, T star is a linear map from W to V if T is a linear map from V to W. Now we have a whole other set of properties of the adjoint. Most of these are quite easy to verify. The first one says the adjoint of a sum is a sum of the adjoints. The next property says the adjoint of a scalar multiple of t is the complex conjugate of the scalar times the adjoint of t. The next one says the adjoint of the adjoint of t is equal to t. In other words, if you do the adjoint twice, you get back to where you started. The next one says that the adjoint of the identity operator is the identity operator. All of these are fairly easy to verify. Please try to do them yourself. Pause the video to do that. And if you get stuck, look at the book. 
the last one we will do here, um, the last one says the adjoint of a product is the product of the adjoints, but in the reverse order. So let's give a proof of that. Here I have repeated the bullet point that we are going to prove. We are going to prove that the adjoint of a product is the product of the adjoints with the order reversed. To prove this, suppose T is a linear map from V to W and S is a linear map from W to another inner product space U. Suppose V is a vector in V and U is a vector in U. Let's look at V inner product the adjoint of st applied to u. Remember the way adjoints work. You flip to the other side. So we flip the st to the other side, giving us the entry on the right side of the displayed equation. Now flip the s to the other side. So we get tv inner product s star of u as shown here. And now flip the t to the other side so it becomes adjointed, getting the equation shown here. Now I've highlighted in red, in the first equation and the last one, the two objects that v is being inner product with. And because this is true for all vectors v and v, those two must, must be equal. In other words, we have the adjoint of st applied to u is equal to the adjoint of t applied to the adjoint of su. That's what we wanted to prove. Please pause the video and go over this proof until it is absolutely clear to you. Now we have an important four-part theorem that tells us the relationship between the null spaces of t and t star and the ranges of t and t star. Suppose t is a linear map from v to w. The first part of this result says that the null space of t star is equal to the orthogonal complement of the range of t. The second part of the result says that the range of t star is equal to the orthogonal complement of the null space of t. Our third result is that the null space of t is the orthogonal complement of the range of t star. And our fourth result is that the range of t is equal to the orthogonal complement of the null space of t star. Let's see how to prove this. We will begin by proving part a. Fix a vector w in w. Then for w to be in the null space of t star is equivalent to saying that t star of w is 0. That's just the definition of null space. t star of w is a 0 vector if and only if, when we inner product with any vector in v, we get 0. Now flip the t to the other side and we get that this is equivalent to the inner product of tv with w being 0 for all vectors v in v. And this is equivalent, just from the definitions, to w being in the orthogonal complement of the range of t. Now I've highlighted the first and the last thing in the string of equivalences, and we can see that what we've proved is that the null space of t star is equal to the orthogonal complement of the range of t. That proves part a. Now take the orthogonal complement of both sides of the equation in part a and use the result that doing the orthogonal complement twice gets us back to the original space, and then we get part d of this result, that the range of t is equal to the orthogonal complement of the null space of t star. Now replace t with t star in part a and use the result that the adjoint of the adjoint gets us back to the original operator. This gives us part c of the result. Finally, replace t with t star in part d, which we have already proved, and again use the result that the adjoint of the adjoint gives us back the original operator to get part b. This completes the proof of all four parts. Again, please stop the video. See if you can prove this without looking at the video or at the book. Condition d above has an important corollary that's often useful. 
Suppose T is a linear map from V to W. We want to know whether or not T is surjective. This result states that T is surjective if and only if the adjoint is injective. Here's why that follows from Part D. We're interested in the question of whether T is surjective. That's equivalent to the question of whether the range of T is everything. By Part D, that's equivalent to the condition that the orthogonal complement of the null space of T star is everything. Well, the orthogonal complement of a subspace can be everything only if the subspace is zero. So that's equivalent to the null space of T star being zero, and that's equivalent to T star being injective. The reason this result is useful is sometimes it's easier to determine that a linear map is injective than to determine that a linear map is surjective. Thus, if we need to prove that T is surjective, it can be easier sometimes to prove that T star is injective. The conjugate transpose of a matrix is obtained by interchanging the rows and columns and then taking the complex conjugate of each entry. Let's look at an example. Here we have, starting off, a matrix with two rows and three columns, so it's a two by three matrix. If we interchange the rows and the columns and then take the complex conjugate of each entry, we get the matrix with three rows and two columns shown below. To make sure you see what's going on, I've now highlighted in red the first row of the original matrix. We make that first row of the original matrix into the first column of the conjugate transpose, which is now shown in red, and take the complex conjugate of each entry. Of course, the first and last entries, 2 and 7, are real, so they're equal to their complex conjugate. But we see that when we take the complex conjugate, the entry originally 3 plus 4i becomes 3 minus 4i. The reason the conjugate transpose is important is the following theorem, which tells us what the matrix of T star is. So suppose we have a linear map T from V to W. If we want to talk about the matrix of T, we need a basis E1 up to EN for V, and a basis F1 up to FM of W. And because we're in an inner product space, we'll assume both those bases are orthonormal. The result says the matrix of T star with respect to the bases F1 through Fm of W and E1 up through Enn of V is the conjugate transpose of the original matrix of T. Be careful when using this theorem. It's only true when both bases are orthonormal. For the proof of this result about the matrix of T star, please see the book. This concludes part one of the video on self-adjoint and normal operators.